Hey. Uh, I'm back. I'm so sorry about that. How <laughs> no. embarrassing. Yay, back. <laughs> oh, the joys of technical difficulties. All right. So, you know, okay, getting back into it. Um, once you've collected your seeds, you're going to grow them out into plants that you can then plant. Um, and this is your opportunity to um, let your plants kind of be exposed to the elements, right? They're getting some outdoor lighting, they're getting some wind action, they're kind of getting toughened up for before you put them in the ground for your restoration project. Um, and then uh, that's all occurring kind of during the spring and summer and late fall. And then once late fall arrives, um, usually when the rain arrives, that's when you're going to take your native plants from one place and you're going to put them somewhere else in the ground. Um, so this occurs like late fall to early spring. Um, you want to coincide this usually with the first rains that we get. Um, usually that's because you um, want your plants to have lots of available water in the soil for them to use up. Um, it's also when the ground is going to be nice and soft. So it's very easy to dig a hole. Um, and this is often a time where you can do a little bit of um, preparation for your plants by mulching them. Um, we like to mulch our plants with like about three inches of wood chips. And this acts as a mulch to help suppress any weeds that might want to germinate. And it also kind of acts as a blanket for the soil as well. Um, it's going to help retain moisture in the soil um, and help um, help the, the soil not get too hot or too cold as well, which can um, cause some shocks for those plants. Um, you know, once um, winter is over and you've planted all of your plants, you then want to prepare for maintaining your plants and doing any weed management that you may want to do. Um, so that removal of weedy or invasive plants can occur throughout the whole year, but is mostly focused um, from spring to fall. And there are lots of different ways that you can remove um, these weeds. Um, they can be removed using hand tools. Um, you can use mechanical methods of removing them if you have that option available to you. Um, and hand pulling is also a great option as well. Um, during that same time, you know, you're going to want to regularly water your plants for at least the first three years. Um, if they're native plants, Really that first year is the critical year that they need to get established in where they're growing out their root systems. After that, you know, you can still water them um, for the first couple of years of their lives. Um, but after three years, they're pretty good on their own and they really don't need a whole lot of help um, from you to get established. Um, if you wanna water them after three years, maybe like once a month just to keep them um, really fresh and perky, like that's awesome as well. Um, but after three years, they should be able to get most of their water needs met on their own. Um, this is kind of an example of um, invasive plant management I want to um, share with you as well, because um, this picture was taken at the Martin Luther King Jr. Shoreline too. And um, there's a few different plant species in here, but the one um, kind of notice there's like one large plant growing on the right. Um, this is a uh, native California sea lavender. And kind of surrounding it, there's like these darker green um, plant called Algerian sea lavender, which is a non-native invasive and um, is, uh, is one that we might be working to remove together um, in a couple of weeks when we're working at the MLK shoreline. Um, but this is a plant that similarly to the cord grass is uh, kind of out competing the native for space. Um, there's a concern that it might hybridize with our native California sea lavender, which could lead to um, the loss of the native species in our wetlands in the future. Um, so just kind of plugging another um, weed that we might be looking out after in the future. But once you put in your plants, this is kind of the time again to maintain the plants that you put in, set them up for success, and do any weeding work that you need to do after. Um, and usually for us, um, we remove all of the weeds that we collect on site, um, and they get taken to like a green composting facility, or we compost them on site as well, um, so that they can be useful in, in another way. Um, once you are, well, as you're doing that process too, you want to be doing a, um, some kind of monitoring work to kind of assess how your restoration site is, is doing over time, right? Um, for a lot of our work, you know, it's grant funded and our funders want to know like, what happened to this restoration site that you all uh, said you were going to restore? Like, how's it looking? Um, 
And there's a couple of different ways that you can kind of, again, measure success through your monitoring, right? So one way that, the way that we um, measure success is we try to determine the percent cover of native and non-native plants at our restoration sites. Um, and that's just like me a measure of how much space do they occupy? Um, is it mostly native plants? Is it mostly non-native plants? Is it like bare ground out there? Another way that might be useful for y'all is like, can you determine success by determining survivorship? So this is like how many plants that you've put in the ground last year are still alive this year. Um, and that's another way you can kind of measure success. Um, and so like, this is an example, this is like some vegetation monitoring that we did just last year where we're trying to determine like how much space in this um, quadrat. So it's just a um, little piece of plastic with strings attached to it. Um, you know, it's one meter, uh, it's one square meter. How much space by percent does like is covered by plants in here, do you think? Um, and how much of it might be like bare soil? Um, curious what y'all think if you want to type in the chat, like, like 70% plants, is it 20%? Like, um, these are kind of the things that we're thinking of as we, um, as we're monitoring. And as, as we do it, we kind of break it into like, you know, what percent each species in here is taking up. Um, but I'm curious if you want to type in the chat, like what you think like percent cover wise is in here by plant. 80% plant. One guess. It also depends too, because if, if you're counting any dead things in there as, as living, you know, you might get a different answer too. Um, that's a great guess. Yeah, very awesome, simple technique. Um, and, you know, you're going to want to do this over, you know, many different spots in your restoration site um, to try and get a good representation of what's there. Um, so I actually have another um, example. Um, so this is one thing that we use to try and um, calibrate ourselves by, um, you know, for guessing percent cover. Um, so if you want to uh, practice along with me, um, my question for you is, what percent of this picture do you think is taken up by the white yellow flowers? So look at this picture. What percent of this picture is taken up by the white or yellow flowers? And think of, you can think of it in your head. I hear 45, 50, 65, 60, 35. So what if I turn them into red? You maybe think about again, like, how much space does that really cover? And if I turn it into black and white, so I'll give you all maybe another 30 seconds to think about what percent is getting taken up by the white and yellow flowers. It's really hard. See, like we're getting a huge range from 90 to 30 to 40. That's a very good point, Veronica. If, you know, if you're just thinking of the flower and not the green stalks, we don't see. Um, if we were doing this in real life, I would say, yes, of course, you have to get the rest of the whole plant. Um, but I think just for this purposes, we're just talking about the flowers. So if we actually look at it, this was done using a computer program to, um, you know, it recolored all of the flowers into black and white. And then, you know, a computer program uh, did this, but, 30%, so a little over 30% is covered by those flowers. Yeah, boy. Yeah, some of y'all did awesome. Some of y'all were right on the money. Um, but I think that just goes to show like, you know, this can be kind of difficult. Um, some people are underestimators and some people are overestimators. I'm an overestimator, so I always have to kind of rein in whatever I think is there. Um, we can do this again um, with this picture of grass. You know, if you were to think what percent cover do you think um, is just covered by the green grass. I'll do the same thing again, where we convert the green into red. I'll give you all maybe 15, 30 seconds again to put in any guesses you have. 70, ooh, we're pretty aligned with 70. 
And I always think, you know, if you're like within 5% of what someone else says, then like, you know, you're pretty much on the money. You know, we're not computers doing this in real life. We're people. 55, I see someone is uh, uh, trying to rein in their overestimating tendencies like I do. We turn this into black and white. Totally 70. Wow. Nailed it. <laughs> So this is just to give you an idea of like, you know, if, you, if you're trying to do some kind of monitoring with your restoration site and guesstimate like, you know, how much cover is taken up by, by the plants you want to install in there, like this is, you know, this is one way of kind of, of um, gauging success too. And so just to kind of wrap up this section of the presentation, um, I wanna bring you back. This is our photo of one of our Eden landing sites where I uh, actually can show you the data. I'm gonna show you the data in a little bit, but I would go to judge that there is like, there is maybe 1%, 5% plant cover in general out here. It's pretty bare. So these were our baseline conditions for this project. Um, this was um, in two, uh, 2011 um, when this photo was taken. And so restoration happens the following year. Um, and six years later, this photo was in 2017. Um, you can see that from this photo is taken from pretty much the same perspective, um, but you can see there are a lot more plant species available uh, that are around here. Um, what you're seeing is mostly the native marsh gum plant, um, which is a really foundational uh, plant species um, in our wetlands. And if we fast forward, this was in 20, um, this one I think was recently, I think this photo was from this year. Um, you can still see there's some marsh gum plant that is in the margins, but what's mostly taking up um, the site here is the native California sagebrush, um, which is another really important native plant here that provides lots of great habitat for wildlife. Um, but this is a way that, you know, photo, using photos, you can really um, share a story about like what, you know, how well did your restoration project work? You know, can I see it with my own eyes that there was, it looked one way in the beginning and it looked totally different um, after you've done your work. Um, so I really, for your project, I really highly recommend, you know, take lots of photos. Um, they're really great at illustrating the work that you're gonna be doing. And you can take some of that data too, if you're doing any kind of percent cover um, monitoring, you can use that data um, to then present, um, you know, with some cold hard facts, like how has your site changed over time? Um, so when we do all that monitoring data with the quadrat, trying to say like, oh, it's this percent cover from native plants and this percent cover from non-native plants, you can then graph that over the years and show, hey, this green line that's showing native plants, it has you know, gone from maybe 5% cover to you know, at some years it's been over 75% native cover, um, which you know, then correlates to hopefully better habitat for wildlife. Um, And so I'll kind of, I'll just pause there. I know um, I'm running a little bit behind schedule, but I just want to pause there for any questions that folks have um, about how you do a restoration project, kind of what the components are. Um, type in the chat, you can unmute, whatever you feel like, those pauses for you. Abiotic, yeah, abiotic just, all of the things that are in an ecosystem that aren't technically alive. Um, so rock, bare ground, um, those things are not necessarily bad either. Um, I think I'll, I'll mention in, in one slide a little bit later, but bare ground is a really important component of a, of a lot of habitats. A lot of um, insects in particular need bare ground because they like to burrow underground. Um, so that's definitely not a bad thing either. And that, that, Non-native uh, cover is not necessarily bad either, but. All right. Um, oh, where do you get the permits for habitat restoration? And do you usually need a CEQA, uh, CEQA review? That's a great question. Um, so the permits that we get for collection are, um, they're um, requested for specifically from whoever it is that we need it for, right? So if we want to do collection in a state park, um, we are going to fill out an application with the California um, you know, State Parks Agency. And usually if you like go on their website and you just like you type in like permits, um, they'll 
send you to whatever website you need um, to, you know, you'll see a form to fill out. Usually for any like um, uh, collection work that we're doing, um, it's under a scientific collection permit um, that gives you permission to collect things from um, those sites. As far as like doing the restoration work on site, um, we have partnerships with the, the land managing agencies, um, whoever that might be, um, to do that restoration work. So usually that's more of a contract or like a, um, a memorandum of understanding where they have, they've given us permission to do that work there. Um, and then the question is, would it, could it be beneficial to a restoration project to have people living in campsites long-term to do the planting and weeding or would that make things complicated with permitting? Um, I think that I think that just depends on on where your project is and what you're doing. Um, I think if you are you know if you're trying to engage um, folks living in campsites to do that, then um, I think that's a great idea. If that's something that they think would be beneficial for themselves, um, or if that's something they want to be involved in, um, I think it just I think it depends. I think I would need a little more context for your question, Adam, but. Um, I don't think that would necessarily make any permitting um, more complicated. Um, I think, especially that would just, you know, you're bringing that, you would be, I assume you would be bringing that uh, community in as a volunteer um, group. But um, uh, so I don't see how necessarily how that would like complicate um, any permitting or permission you would need. Um, and yeah, campsites are often. Um, yeah, folks are often pushed into those areas um, to survive. So um, I think bringing those folks in um, to this work would be amazing. Um, uh, but I definitely, yeah, I'm not sure I have a, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that question. But um, oh, so how are our projects funded? Too is another question. So um, a lot of our projects are funded um, on a project basis through grants or contracts. Um, so I mentioned, um, like I, I showed you some of our work at Eden Landing. Um, that project specifically was funded through a um, BART mitigation um, fund. So BART needed to, um, I think this was related to when they built um, the, like the monorail line from uh, Oakland Airport to the Coliseum Station. Um, when they did that project, they destroyed a, a, a certain amount of wetland to do that. And so they had to fund for the restoration of wetlands somewhere else. Um, and so they often, um, you know, they'll find partners like us who are able to do that work and then they'll fund it. So that's one way that they do it. Um, another is through contracts. Um, so um, with our work at um, the Ravenswood um, Wetland Restoration Project, um, that's funded through a grant um, or through a contract with the State Coastal Conservancy. So they, they needed someone to propagate and install plants for that project. Um, we bid on it um, and we received that uh, contract. So they're, they're paying us directly to do that work. And then other sites are sometimes funded through grants. So um, foundations or um, groups like the National Fish and Wildlife Federation um, raise money every year to fund restoration projects. And you can apply for a grant to do, um, to do that restoration work. Um, so you usually have to come in with some kind of like project um, proposal and you'll send that to them. If they agree that they wanna fund that project, they will. Um, that's a great question, Maria. Um, I think I'll move on just cause I know I'm, I'm running out of time. I love to talk too much. Um, and could someone from this cohort collaborate with Save the Bay? If so, what are the steps to start that process? Um, that's a great question, Prescott. Um, let's maybe talk about that in person on our on our day in two weeks, because um, there are lots of ways that you can get involved with Save the Bay um, through like volunteer work. Um, we have a fellowship, um, a paid fellowship opportunity as well. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, um, but there are lots of there's lots of ways, and um, I'm not sure I'm the best person uh, to um, get you started on that, um, but I can find out for you. Um, so I'm just going to kind of briefly go over ecosystem services. Um, and I just wanted to ask you all again, like, what does that term mean to you? Like, what, what do you think an ecosystem service is? 
and you can unmute if you want to chat in the um, type in the chat, whatever you feel like. Hi, I think ecosystem services are like the the resources that we are given from nature and also the protection that we can provide for it. I think it's like an exchange, like a mutual existence or a mutual exchange. Yeah, that's a great, yeah. So there's like resources. There are things that, you know, ecosystems and nature provide to us um, that we also provide to nature as well. Um, so yeah, like, like reciprocal nature, right? Like if we take care of nature, nature is going to take care of us. Um, yeah, great um, benefits to the environment that are created by the habitat. Um, totally, right? So ecosystem services are definitely, they're beneficial things that, um, you know, we receive by our ecosystem. Um, another word for gardener, um, maybe there's, there's like a connection there. Um, overall caretaking of the ecosystem comprehensively. Um, so I think I might flip that and say, it's like, it's kind of how ecosystems take care of us, right? Um, so one definition is like, ecosystem services are the benefits that people derive from ecosystems. Um, and so this can be, there are lots of different ways we can look at this, right? Um, like provisioning services or goods, like food and water or building material. Um, it can be regulation services, so pollinating our crops, purifying water, um, preventing soil erosion are all ecosystem services, um, or cultural uh, services like having a place to recreate or, you know, having a sense of place. These are all things that we can kind of define as ecosystem services. Um, you know, one thing, one way that I like to look at it is like, what is like the cost of like having clean air, right? Like if everyone takes a big deep breath right now, if you had to like pay money for that, right? Like this is like, you know, capitalist BS, but um, I'll play devil's advocate. Like if you had to pay money for that, like how much would that cost? It didn't cost you anything to take a, a deep breath of air right now. And that's because nature is providing that service to us you know, for free, so long as we take care of the environment and, you know, can maintain this. Um, but it's, it's ecosystem services are all of these things that nature is doing for us that we don't necessarily are paying for, um, you know, monetarily, but if we had to, would be very, very expensive, right? We had to like provide clean air for everybody and you had to pay for it. That'd be ridiculous. And we hope we never live in a world where we have to do that. But the ecosystem services are things like that. You know, these services that we're not necessarily paying for, um, but that nature is providing to us. Um, and wetlands specifically, um, there are quite a few um, services that ecosystems are providing us. Um, things like clean water, economic benefits, um, helping to control global warming um, and moderating, you know, our, our atmospheric environment. Uh, habitat for sensitive species. We've kind of talked a lot about that um, with regard to um, the Ridgeways Rail and the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouth. Um, providing open space for recreation and protecting our communities from floods and sea level rise. Um, and so I'll spend just kind of like the next five, 10 minutes talking briefly about um, those things specifically. Um, but with regard to purifying water, um, you know, a lot of our wetlands here in the Bay Area um, provide um, filtering opportunities from trash and pollution that is coming from upstream. Um, you know, a lot of those sources of pollution are, you know, can be like sewer grates that have are overflowing with trash or um, trash cans that are not closed to the environment. So they can overflow. Um, all of that trash eventually, you know, during a rainstorm can get flushed down into our drain. You've probably seen like the no dumping flows to bay sign over most um, sewer grates that you see. And that's because all of our sewer grates are connected to the bay. So any trash that ends up in there ends up in the bay. Um, but wetland plants provide an opportunity to kind of screen that trash before it gets out into the bay. And it can then be like picked up or removed manually. Um, these wetlands also kind of slow the flow of water down. And that allows little microbes that exist 
in, um, in, in the sediments, um, inside like the roots of some of these plants or in the water to actually like break down some of these harmful chemicals. Um, you know, one big source of oil pollution in the Bay is actually just cars that haven't been maintained well. Um, and what's really cool is that there are microbes that live in wetlands that are actually able to break some of those compounds down. So having healthy wetlands means we have uh, nice clean water in the Bay as well. Um, moderating our atmosphere is a really important um, thing that all habitats do, um, but that wetlands are especially good at. I think everyone is probably familiar with how, you know, uh, global warming works, right? Like we're burning um, fossil fuels that contain carbon. Um, we're converting that carbon into carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is warming up, is capturing heat and warming up the atmosphere. And I'm sure we probably also all remember from, you know, uh, you know, elementary school biology, right? That plants do photosynthesis. So they get their energy by absorbing carbon dioxide and sunlight and converting that into sugars or into biomass, right? Their own bodies. And that process of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil, which plants do, is called carbon sequestration. So they're sequestering that carbon. They're making sure it doesn't escape from the soil um, back into the atmosphere where it can contribute to climate change. And all plants do this. You know, trees are pretty good at doing this. A lot of our native grasses um, are even better than trees at sequestering or capturing this carbon. But wetlands are especially good at sequestering carbon dioxide. Um, this is a thing called blue carbon. So wetland plants, um, because they, um, when they die, they are in an anoxic environment, which just means that there's little oxygen because they're you know, there's a lot, not a lot of um, available oxygen in, in just water. Um, they don't decompose in the same way that plants might if they are living um, in upland habitat. Um, so when they decompose, that carbon gets stored in marsh uh, soils a lot better than like trees or grasses can. Um, so they're really, really good at, you know, taking carbon dioxide from the air and keeping it in the soil where it can't contribute to climate change. The really, really important ecosystem service of, of wetlands. Habitat, again, is another really important um, uh, service that, wet, that wetlands and all habitats are providing. Um, you know, things like, you know, habitat is just like all the things that organisms require to, to thrive. Um, so providing water, providing food, providing um, structure, protection, um, or cover from predators are all really important things that habitats provide. Um, I think I'm gonna, I might skip over this, that structure is just a really important component of all habitats. So whether, you know, you have kind of an open grassland or a habitat that's dominated by shrubs or a forest with big tall trees, all those habitats are gonna support different species of animals. Um, but that being said, like, not all plants provide habitat. So, you know, you've probably seen a lot of um, landscapes like this where, um, you know, in our urban and suburban environments where, you know, a lot of these plants here, if you think about if you're like a bird or an insect, like what food uh, are you getting from like a bare lawn? Or, you know, like what protection from predators are you getting um, from these landscaping plants? Or like, can you build a nest in any of these things? Um, Maybe yes, maybe not, depending on um, on the you know kind of wildlife you're trying to protect. Um, but not all plants are are kind of created equal when it comes to um, providing that habitat. Um, kind of one example I like to show off um, are these two um, kind of similar plants. Does anybody know um, what two tree species we're looking at here? oak and eucalyptus? Nailed it, yeah. So this is a coast live oak on the left that's a uh, native uh, California um, oak tree. And on the right is a eucalyptus plant. So these are two uh, trees. So they have similar structure, right? They're nice and big and tall. 
So if you're a bird that, you know, you like to perch up on a tall tree so you can look for food, you know, you might like both of these, you might hang out in both of these trees, right? So they're providing habitat comparably in some ways, but in other ways they really don't. And um, the big reason why is for um, insects. So the coast live oak supports over 500 different species of insects, um, which then go on to feed you know, all of the other animals that are higher up in the food chain. Eucalyptus trees, insects, they might like live on them, but not many things are really like eating it. It's not supporting as many um, directly as many species um, of insects um, on itself like, like an oak tree would. So even though animals might use it for habitat, it's really not supporting the entire ecosystem the way uh, a native oak tree might. Um, and one example, uh, this is just a fun one, um, oh, is uh, with this pollinator. Um, this is one of my favorite insects. This is called a white lined sphinx moth. Um, they have like these really beautiful, um, you know, like kind of pink fuchsia, like um, wing marks on them. And they're pretty um, uh, meaty for a, for a moth. They're native to California. They're really important pollinators, but they only lay their eggs on one specific um, group of plants that are in a family called the evening primrose family. Um, and plants in this family generally have like four petals and four sepals. So if you're this animal and you have maybe these three flowers, you have a, a woodland clarkia, an agapanthus or a fireweed around you, um, maybe it can like, drink the nectar of all of those plants, but which of these plants do you think it cannot lay its eggs on? I'll give you all maybe like 30 seconds if you wanna put in the chat or unmute yourself. Which do you think, um, which of these species do you think this moth cannot lay its eggs on? Is it the lily of the Nile? That's a great guess. So let's see. So, it can lay its eggs on a woodland clarkia because this is in the evening primrose family. It has four petals. It can lay its eggs on fireweed because it has eight petals, so groups of four. But it can't lay its eggs on an agapanthus. And probably most other landscapey kind of plants that you see in like an urban or suburban environment don't support um, insects um, that are really specific about what kind of plants they can lay their eggs on. Um, so this is one of the reasons why I'm a big native plant advocate is that, you know, non-native plants, they might support some uh, insects in some ways, but they're not going to support um, the diversity of insects that are here in California, like a native, like native plants will. Um, and then kind of, I think just a couple more examples of, um, of some ecosystem services, I know I'm running close to time, um, is flood protection, right? So this is a photo from uh, the Embarcadero in San Francisco um, during a king tide. And you can see um, it is flooding in a place that most people are hanging out or going on walks or riding their bikes. Um, this is something um, that if there were wetlands here, wetlands would be able to absorb some of this water and give it a place to, to flow instead of um, flooding up onto the street. Um, you know, the Embarcadero has like a hardscape seawall that just pushes water around um, and pushes floodwaters into other places, um, mostly places that can't afford to build a seawall. Um, if instead there were a wetland there, that wetland might act as a sponge um, because you know wetland sediments, wetland soils are really good at absorbing water, and they give that um, the, the the water that is coming out from a storm a place to go um, and a place to absorb. So it goes into the wetlands and not flooding, you know, instead of flooding people's homes. And just one example of um, a place where um, wetlands or having more wetlands would have come in handy is in Houston. Um, back in 2017 during Hurricane Harvey, you know, there was really extensive flooding of a lot of um, communities in Houston where, you know, urban sprawl had kind of paved over a lot of wetlands um, and creeks that were there before you know, these uh, communities were built up. And because Houston didn't have a lot of protection, um, didn't have a lot of laws or regulations in place on where you could and couldn't build, a lot of communities ended up getting built in floodplain. A lot of the wetlands that were historically there that would have absorbed those floodwaters 
um, were no longer there to do their job. And instead water was flowing over the hardscapes that were put in place. And we know that with sea level rise and climate change, we're gonna get more and more intense storms as well, um, making the risk of flooding and sea level rise um, that much more dangerous, um, which is why we really need to restore wetlands everywhere we can as much as possible. Um, really quickly too, I know I'm running close on time. Another ecosystem service that plants provide us is their pollination, um, is pollination services. So having lots of um, healthy habitat for pollinators is really important if we like to eat things like potatoes or blackberries or melon. Um, I chose all of these species to represent pollination services because these are um, plant species that are not pollinated by honeybees. They need or require pollination by bumblebees, um, which are also in decline um, because of habitat loss. So restoring habitat protects um, honeybee or not honeybee, bumblebee habitat which then ensures that we have um, you know, a delicious assortment of fruits and vegetables to choose from um, at, the, at the grocery store. Um, also for protecting habitat is really important for um, wildlife that we like to eat as well. Um, so if you, like, you know, if you like to eat fish, um, most of the fish that we like to eat like anchovies, salmon, um, herring, et cetera, et cetera, all require estuaries. Um, or wetlands, uh, at least for a part of their life cycle, right? So if you think of something like salmon that are, you know, uh, go upstream to lay their eggs, those eggs hatch and the little juvenile salmon spend part of their life cycle in a wetland by an estuary to get a little bit bigger before they go out into the open ocean. Um, so there's a really critical habitat for a lot of um, wildlife that we like to eat, which is a really important ecosystem service. Excuse me. And then lastly, just for recreating, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, historically the bay had very little um, publicly accessible shoreline. Um, there used to be less than six miles of shoreline that was available to the public, and that's changed a lot over the past five or six decades or so. There's now an incredible um, kind of like uh, network of trails um, across the bay that are accessible to the public. Um, you know, that are open to all to recreate in. Um, lots of miles of um, water trail as well, where people can go boating or kayaking or fishing. Um, and that is an important uh, service as well that ecosystems provide us. Um, and I think since I'm just a little bit over time, I'm just gonna cut it off there. Um, and I just wanna say thank you all to giving me your time to talk about restoration and ecosystem services. Um, I'll pause here in case anyone has any lingering questions, um, but this is my contact info if you want to follow up with me personally, um, or if you want to talk about other opportunities to work with Save the Bay, um, you can contact me here, and I'm happy to share these um, slides out for you as well, um, so you can refer back to them, but thank you again, and I'll, um, I'll just pause for any questions or comments anyone has. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Devani. I just want to echo, echo the thank you that we're getting in the chat. Really appreciate this presentation and you coming out today. Thanks so much for having me, Phoenix. I really enjoyed getting to chat with y'all and I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with y'all